So multiple sclerosis is the leading cause of neurological impairment in young adults in the Western world. It carries a heavy burden as it affects people when they are fostering their career, planning to marry, full of projects. It has not only a human cost, but an economic one, because it affects people when, who are the working force of a country. And to illustrate the repercussion, physical and psychological, of multiple sclerosis, I think that this picture from a fundraising campaign from the British Society for Multiple Sclerosis are very illustrative. And you see on the top left a back with a shear in the middle. That symbolizes the fact that multiple sclerosis can affect the spinal cord and therefore lead to numbness, sensitive problems, weakness, even paralysis. But it can also affect the eyes, leading sometimes to blindness. And on the bottom left, what you can see is a very important feature of this disease. It is the uncertainty. Indeed, living with multiple sclerosis is as if you were living with a Damocles, Damocles sword above your head. You never know when the next relapse will take place. You never know how severe it will be. And finally, although the disease is not hereditary, it, of course, has a strong impact on the family members. It is the famous French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot who described the disease in the 19th century. And his description still holds true two centuries later. He had recognized the characteristic features of the disease, which are illustrated here. First, the fact that the neurons are deprived of their sheath. At this time, he didn't know that the sheath was called myelin. It was discovered 10 years later. And we now know that myelin allows the electrical conduction, the nervous conduction, to travel fast along the neurons. When you have a loss of myelin, such as in multiple sclerosis, then you have neurological impairment. But he also recognized the fact that the inflammation is paramount in multiple sclerosis. And you see that on the bottom right, he described these fatty globules in a small vein in a multiple sclerosis plaque. And actually, these fatty globules are now called leukocytes. They are white blood cells, which are very important for inflammation. So what triggers multiple sclerosis is an immune attack against the brain and the spinal cord, as if it was a big bug, a microbe. So what, what forces the immune system to recognize its own body as a target, we still don't know. What we think, and there is for that a general agreement in the literature, is that there is a collaboration between genetic and environmental factors. So genetic, the factors from the host, and environment, the factor from the outside. But how do they talk to each other? This is not known. And let me introduce you first to the most significantly associated environmental factor with multiple sclerosis. And to introduce this topic, I will read an email that was sent to me by one of my patients. And I read, I've recently spoken with my first girlfriend with whom I was 20 years ago. It was likely thanks to her that I contracted infectious mononucleosis. Herself had gotten the disease the year before we were together, and three years ago, she presented the same neurological symptoms as I have now. I have no idea whether this information is relevant or whether this is merely a coincidence. I just wanted to let you know. Well, I think it's very interesting, because this patient, without knowing it, points to the most important environmental factor, at least the one that is the most significantly associated with multiple sclerosis, which is the infection with Epstein-Barr virus. In particular, when this infection is done through the kissing disease, these famous mononuclease infections that affects teenagers. But the majority of people who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus are infected when they are babies, and at this time, the infection is asymptomatic. The more than 80% of the general population is infected with this virus, and of course, we do not all have multiple sclerosis. So there must be 
other factors, genetic factors, that allow the disease to take place. These are viruses, Epstein-Barr viruses, that were electron microscoped by the Pasteur Institute in France. But let me show you the relationship between the status of Epstein-Barr virus infection and the risk of multiple sclerosis. And you can see, this is the green line, that subjects who are not infected with Epstein-Barr virus, it's approximately 10% of the general population, they have virtually no risk to develop multiple sclerosis. At least this is true for the adults. The red line represents the vast majority of subjects, those who got the virus when they were children. And you can see that they have an intermediate risk. And those who had a kissing disease have the highest risk, this is the blue line, to develop a multiple sclerosis, 2.5 times higher than the Epstein-Barr positive asymptomatic, and much, much higher risk than those who are Epstein-Barr negative. But again, the, 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 it's not like HIV. When you have HIV, you have the disease. Here, it's not the same. The virus, the virus is there, but it's probably a necessary condition, but not sufficient to trigger the disease. So to look into more details for the possible interaction between Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis, ideally, we would like to go where the money is. That means in the brain. However, we don't have access directly to the brain of multiple sclerosis patients, and this is fortunate for them, because they very rarely need a brain biopsy. So we have to find other ways. There are some rather good animal models of multiple sclerosis, but mice are not infected with Epstein-Barr virus, so we forget this aspect. So we stick with human. But now we have to look at the footprint that the virus leaves in our body. And the best way to look at this footprint is the immune system. When a cell is infected by a virus, because the virus needs to infect cells to survive, the cell has a way to signal to the immune system that it is infected. Hey, guys, I'm infected, please come. And to do so, the cell will chop the virus into very small pieces called epitopes, here in red, and it will express it on the surface of its membrane. But an epitope needs to be chaperon, if you want, by a molecule from the host. This molecule is called HLA. And the HLA is genetically determined. So it depends on the host. And there are different HLA in different subjects. This is the reason why we do not all respond the same way to an infection. And if you want, this viral pitop is like a pearl into an oyster that would be the HLA molecule. And this complex is recognized by a killer cell, the CD8 T lymphocyte. But CD8 T lymphocytes are educated killers. They kill only when they recognize the complex for which they have been formed. Viral epitope plus HLA molecule. Once they recognize this complex, the CD8 T lymphocytes, which are like weapon, will kill their target cells with ammunition, which are the cytotoxic granules. And these granules will destroy the infec virus-infected cell. So we thought, if Epstein-Barr virus plays a role in multiple sclerosis, then we should look at the best footprint, which are the CD8 T cells. But how to identify CD8 T lymphocytes in the billions of cells in the blood of a patient? So we need to identify those of interest, those which are specific for the virus. And to do so, we use a fancy tool called Tetramer. And basically, what we did is, in vitro, we recreated the lock. That means we created the HLA molecule plus the Epstein-Barr viral epitopes, and we tetramerized it in presence of a fluorescent molecule. And now we have a probe that will specifically attach to the CD8 lymphocytes that were educated to recognize this complex. So if you want, the lock goes to find its key. But it's more complicated because, as I said, there are different HLA in different subjects. So 
we need to know what is the HLA type of a patient before using our tetramer. There are different HLA, HLA A1, A2, B3, B7, B8, etc., etc. So if you construct a tetramer, let's say A2, you must be sure that your patient is A2, otherwise you have no information. So first, what we did is that we, we HLA typed hundreds of multiple sclerosis patients that we are following and control subjects. And we wanted to know the genetic part of their disease. What are their HLA? And we found that actually multiple sclerosis in yellow and healthy control subjects in blue do not behave the same way. And you can see that the HLA-A2 molecule, which is a very prevalent uh, HLA in the Western world, is much significantly lower in multiple sclerosis than controls. And the contrary is true for HLA-B7. That means that genetically, we are not the same in terms of risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Those who are A2 positive seem to be protected. Those who are B7 positive seem to be at higher risk. Now we have the genetic part. What is the link with the environmental part? So let's come back to our Epstein-Barr virus. Because now what we want is to look at the CD8 T lymphocyte specific for an Epstein-Barr virus epitope presented by these different HLA. And what we did is that not only we identified these CD8 lymphocytes, but we looked what they had in their guts. How many ammunition? And we found that for HLA-A2 and B8 patients, there was no difference. However, for those who are B7, then we could see that they had significantly less cytotoxic granules, so ammunition, in their CD8 T cells. That means that those patients are less able to control Epstein-Barr virus infection. And probably here, the virus is not completely kept on check, and there is an ongoing inflammation, and this could contribute to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. But it also shows us that now there is a link between genetic factors, here the HLA, and environmental factors, the Epstein-Barr virus mediated by the immunity. To conclude, the research I'm conducting in my lab on the SHUV, in the SHUV is really all about links. Links between neurology and immunology, links between clinic and research, between virus and host immunity, and finally, between genetic and environment. But finally, is it really important to try to nail down the cause of multiple sclerosis? Are we wasting time? I don't think so. Because I remind you that there is unfortunately no cure for multiple sclerosis. And I doubt that we are able to find a cure if we don't know the precise mechanism that leads to this disease. And this is precisely what we are trying to do, is to really, based on this environment, try to find a cure for this disease. And based on our finding, we hope that if this is confirmed, we may develop a potent antiviral medication because there is no good anti-Epstein-Barr medication and or a vaccine for this virus. But this is a vision for the future. Thank you very much. What I'd like to show you today is something in the way of an experiment. Today is its debut. It's a demonstration of augmented reality. And the visuals you're about to see are not pre-recorded. They are live and reacting to me in real time. <laughs> 